exponential thinking. That's uh, for one and a half hours subject. Um, and just as a quick introduction, uh, it's already been made, so really quickly. Uh, in the past three years, I've been working for Singularity Benelux, and just since a few weeks, I've actually gone into my own venture, being exponential, that focuses a lot more on the mindset uh, and also on the culture. Because it's one thing to think exponentially, uh, and to learn about the tools and the frameworks, very important. Uh, but how do you indeed cultivate that mindset and bring that into your organization? That's for me now my next steps uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur. Um, and I will guide you through in, e in each uh, the slides, the presentation of how to start thinking exponentially. Um, before we go into the future, I first want to go back with you in time where we all come from. You know, we come from an era that is local and linear. Our ancestors, 10,000 years ago, maybe I'm romanticizing a bit, uh, not much changed in their surroundings. The sun came up, the sun went down. Uh, of course, winter and, uh, and summer and uh, uh, the changes of, uh, of, uh, of the weather. Uh, of course, they had villages, settlements, and they had conversations around campfires. I'm really romanticizing this, but not much changed. Our brains haven't had an update since then. Our brain hasn't had an update uh, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. But our world has really changed. Our brain is made to think or to judge linearly to be aware of maybe the gazelle coming over the fields and being able to judge the distance and being able to shoot that arrow. Um, you know, at the moment it's very easy to judge a car coming down the street, you know, judge the speed of that and being able to uh, m move over the street in a safe uh, manner. So that's where we come from. Um, but the world is changing indeed. If we just look at... Uh, slides working... Perfect. This is uh, the amount of innovations that have happened 10,000 years ago uh, till now to date. Uh, a truly exponential graph on two ways. One is population growth and the other is all the innovations that have happened. And you can see it's in the last 50 years that has really, really ramped up or the last 100 years maybe. Um, so this is the world that we're living in an exponential and global uh, world, interconnected technology uh, at our fingertips. Every day we live today, we get more information than our ancestors or our uh, ancestors did 300 years ago. Every day we get more information than someone did in a whole lifetime 300 years ago. And our brain hasn't had that update. So I want to give you a video to, pri oh, to prime you, uh, this is a video from Singularity Benelux, uh, where we are heading and what our biggest challenges are. Please enjoy, and I'll come back with you in just a second. It takes a while to start up. It seems to be a time of nearly limitless possibility. We're conquering one obstacle after another. Every milestone paves the way for the next one all at dazzling speeds. What seems impossible today will be reality tomorrow. The question is not, will a technological vision ever become a reality? Because the answer is clear, it will. The real question is, what kind of change do you wish to see in this world of endless possibilities? What is progress? Which obstacles are we willing to solve what vision do you prefer to make a reality? It's easy to see yourself riding the exponentially growing wave of technology. But who's in the lead in life? Who's in control? Technology or you? Who has the power to steer developments in the right direction? How do you agree on a future you are willing to be responsible for? More than ever, the world needs pioneers trailblazers, pathfinders, brave souls who dare to reach beyond the horizon. 
To explore the currently unknown. I'm not real. I'm not real. To build tremendous knowledge. Step by step. Go-getters that make the difference. Stick their necks out and lead the way. Never standing by indifferently letting others decide for them. Those who see the unknown as an opportunity and forge their own path. What's holding you back? What are you waiting for? If not you, who? If not now, when? We'll help you get started. Let's solve this together. Ready to be the change? Yeah, so very much an invitation for you as entrepreneur, as innovator, to look at the world uh, and the big challenges that we face today, uh, but to see those also as an opportunity to solve through using exponential technologies. Um, these challenges may seem daunting today, but in the near future, uh, they will be manageable. Um, and as uh, Singularity has also taken a look at what these challenges are at the moment, and uh, came up with these global grand challenges. Um, familiar perhaps with the SDGs of the UN? They are similar, of course. Um, and, you know, we come from a society where we've created silos, right? The industrial age is very much about uh, um, creating uh, units that uh, are packaged in silos, and yeah, that's. Uh, created the issues we have at the moment, much part. We want more holistic approach. Um, so yes, these are 12 separate uh, challenges, but actual fact, they all merge and blend together. So it's a lot more complex than just these 12 challenges. I just want to give you a feel for uh, how they are interconnected. Um, you know, just take one of those examples, and it's a challenge to myself. Uh, how far I'm going to get with actually connecting all these dots. Uh, but let's uh, take food, for instance. Um, you know, food is, of course, a very important industry, uh, but it's also quite a polluting industry. It uses the most land uh, 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 of all the industries, creates a lot of CO2, uh, and, of course, a lot of methane also if we look at the meat production. Um, but not only that, it's, of course, also use of herbicides and pesticides that we need. Uh, I think we need that to grow all the f uh, produce, but that then contam contaminates the environment. So I've now connected it with one other global grand challenges, ch challenge, the environment, but also with water. So now I'm going to see if I can connect it all with all the other global grand challenges. So food production uses a lot of water. One kilogram of beef uh, was 15,000 liters of water needed. It's a huge. Um, but also the energy needed to produce all this. If you look at the feed uh, for the, uh, the livestock, it takes up a lot of space and a lot of energy. Um, also, of course, the logistics of taking uh, uh, feed from the other part of the world and transporting that to the other part of the world. Um, then, uh, at the moment, we have an issue with prosperity. You know, we have enough food. It's not the issue that we don't have enough, but it's not equally distributed. Uh, you could also say that, at the moment, we have uh, a global uh, problem, uh, and that is malnutrition in emerging countries, but also in the West. Uh, and then I'm looking at um, micronutrient deficiency. You know, so in the Netherlands, very, very famous for <laughs> being able to grow really fast uh, vegetables and tomatoes that are really good for, for the, uh, you know, the, uh, the economy or the, the, the price. Um, but the macro uh, micronutrients are, are missing and are lacking. So you could say that even in the West, we are uh, malnourished. And that then has an effect on our health. So how far am I? Okay, so I still need to connect it with uh, shelter and security and disaster resilience. Okay, um, so looking at uh, uh, also the biodiversity. 
So uh, with agriculture comes monoculture. If I look in the Netherlands, I'm not sure how it is in Latvia, we call the Netherlands sometimes the green desert because there's less uh, plants and animals and biodiversity in agricultural land than there is in cities. Uh, and that then has an issue with uh, reference to our climate uh, uh, resilience. So there I'm going to look at disaster resilience. Um, and of course, also, we want to protect our food uh, produce. Uh, we want it to be secure. We don't want it uh, to quickly uh, be able to be destroyed by uh, um, pests or uh, fungus or fungi. So also there is the security of the food, very important. Uh, and now I'm wondering, can I get shelter in there as well? Hmm. I'll leave that one for the next time. But here you can see already, everything is intertwined. Everything is connected. And that's the complexity that we now have to work with and deal with. But also in that complexity, uh, there are uh, solutions. Um, but to give you some hope, because this feels maybe a bit of doom and gloom, uh, we have a lot of technology. We have a lot of technology that is already online and will give us the possibility to come up with solutions. Uh, and this is just an overview of a few. There are so many more coming online every day. So you can also think, of course, of AR, VR, blockchain, big data. Um, and yeah, these technologies have the power to actually tackle these global grand challenges. If we as humans uh, have uh, the passion uh, and the mindset to actually utilize them in a way. Um, and this word exponential has been mentioned now, I don't know how many times, quite a lot, but this is what exponential looks like. So maybe go back uh, to your math uh, days, or maybe this is uh, uh, in a bank what you're busy with all exponential growth, but this is what it looks like. And an exponential curve is di different than uh, a linear curve in the fact that it doubles every certain amount of time. So it goes from 1 to 2 to 4, 8 to 16, 32, 64, 128. That's the, the doubling of, uh, of the value, and that's how you get this exponential curve. And so our technology is on this exponential curve. And what is underlying that exponential curve is Moore's Law. Uh, who hasn't heard of Moore's Law? Okay. Hasn't? Yeah. So who has? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So just uh, to give a refresher for who, who's heard and, for, uh, and, and to explain for who hasn't, uh, this is Gordon Moore. This is the one of the uh, uh, founders of Intel. And Intel, we of course know of the company that, the ma that makes the chips that are in our phones and our computers. And back in the 60s, he saw that every two years, roughly, you could put twice as many transistors on a chip. And he coined that Moore's Law. Now, actually, it's not a law. It's more a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that engineers, give me some water, that engineers actually knew or had this guiding principle of where they needed to get to in the coming two years, how many transistors they needed to get on that chip. And now looking back, Moore's Law has been uh, yeah, upheld all these decades. Uh, very proud actually to say that it's not Silicon Valley that is driving this, but actually it's Europe. Yeah, Europe is market leader in creating the machines that supply Intel uh, with the possibility of creating these chips. And I'm very proud to say actually that it's the Netherlands and even more so that it's the region where I live in. So uh, everywhere I go, I'm a good advocate for our region. Um, so we are driving, Europe is driving this Moore's Law. Moore's Law will end. Actually, you could say maybe it's already ended, but I'll get into that in just a minute. I want to first give you uh, an example of what is happening and what we have experienced already. So this is a supercomputer the ASCII Red. And it was released in 1997 
and the price back then was $55 million. And it had 1.3 teraflops, and the flop is the way to calculate how fast a computer can calculate. So it was 1.3 teraflops back then. If we look nine years later, Sony came out with the PlayStation 3. It had 2.1 teraflops, so nearly twice as fast as the uh, supercomputer back then, but a lot smaller. The other one is as big as a fridge, and this like that. And I wonder who had had one, has one, or knew someone who has a PlayStation 3. Yeah, quite f quite a few people. Price only $500 back then. So an enormous uh, uh, change. But it gets even crazier. This Pi Zero came out in 2015. And the Pi Zero is a complete computer that fits on my palm of my hand. You can see the HDMI port and the USB ports down there. 191 megaflops, so not tera, but megaflops. But the price, only $5. Yeah, meaning that for the price of, okay, quite a big, large, expensive cappuccino, you actually get two and a half supercomputers in your pocket. So this is the Cray supercomputer. Uh, some uh, some boys had this poster up uh, uh, at their bed. It sort of defined supercomputers back then. Just imagine it's so big that these were seats that you could sit on, right? Very large. But one of these supercomputers already more computing power than NASA had to put us on the moon. And that's just sitting in our pocket. Um, but we're also getting a lot smaller. So this is a golf ball. Within the golf ball, the dimple, a chip. A chip also from a company in the Netherlands. Sorry, these are my examples. I thought I'd bring some examples over from the Netherlands that you've perhaps not heard of yet. Um, but this chip can connect this ball, this golf ball, to the internet. Don't know why you would do that. Are there any golfers in the in the room? Okay. We'll see next. Um, but yeah, this is an example of the Internet of Things. Who has heard of the Internet of Things? Exactly. Well, you know, the saying is what can be connected will be connected. And everything can be connected, even the seat you're sitting on. Uh, and so also the golf ball. And if you look at the price, it was back in 2014. Already then, it was not about price. It's affordable to connect everything to the Internet. I would say that actually connected devices uh, will be cheaper than non-connected devices. That in the future, uh, offline will be a luxury that you have to be able to afford. Can anybody give me an example? And you're sitting quite close, so I'll look at you. Why? Um, why would that be? Why would? Why would something be that is connected be cheaper than not connected? Yeah. So you're saying the data there is being used for ad uh, advertisements and. That's also a business model. Exactly. And you need to... Exactly. You need to pay to not see the ads. Yeah. Ah, okay. Do you have a better one? No, uh, I'm just curious, yeah. Yes. You're creating a new problem. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's going to be standard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, al and also there is a, um, um, another part to it that, you know, for instance, for seats, you can see that someone is using the seat or not using the seat, so a different business model might also be possible uh, looking into the... Um, in the industry and the uh, and seeing that everything is utilized perfectly or as as good as possible so maybe you need less and therefore you have more efficiency but yeah it's coming it's here uh, and there'll be billions of connected devices in the coming years coming online again mm. and but it gets even smaller and crazier so this is neural dust um, and this uh, was created in 2016 by uh, UC Berkeley and this is actually a chip that is implanted within your body. So it's not a wearable, but it's an insidable. And this one is actually created for your brain. It's not 
something you can purchase. It's not something that, uh, not yet at least, but they are using now already to uh, create brain machine interfaces so that people that have uh, don't have the use of their limbs uh, or have a prosthetic limb can actually operate the limb through these neural dust uh, sensors. Um, but maybe more amazingly is that you know you hear that a lot the supercomputer in your pocket and this is actually the uh, iPhone uh, 10 so not the newest already five teraflops so twice as powerful again as the Sony PlayStation so this computing power is on this exponential curve and it's not slowing down right um, but Moore's law is ending Moore's law is ending because actually we're getting into the the smallest part that we cannot go smaller anymore we cannot we cannot physically go smaller so physics is now uh, the barrier for Moore's law but computing power will increase but there will be different te technologies because if you look at this uh, Moore's law is actually only in these two parts so from this era onwards the integrated uh, circuit and the transistor and this is a, a graph uh, made by Ray Kurzweil and it's actually the law of accelerating returns where he looked back all the way back into 1900 and, s and looked how much computing power can I get for a thousand dollars and he plotted that on this graph and this graph is a logarithmic graph meaning it goes from uh, uh, bounds from 10 to 100 to a thousand to uh, 10,000 so an exponential line would actually be a straight line here but you can see that even this line is curving up slightly so I used to want to come over wise I still do but I've yeah sort of left that uh, in the corner as not happening anytime soon uh, but I said you know the only constant is change well if I look at this graph uh, change isn't even a constant because the change is also uh, uh, increasing so yes we do live in these times where a lot of things are changing and happening uh, but that will only get more and more and more uh, so integrated circuit will end somewhere but new technology will come alive as we've seen throughout history uh, anybody an idea what a next phase could be in computing power quantum oh that's a quantum leap absolutely so quantum computing uh, is already being developed there are stories about quantum computers here and there uh, still hush hush uh, not functional super functional yet perhaps yes perhaps no but that is absolutely something that will be a quantum leap in computing power uh, anything else another technology that's maybe a bit more uh, in the door is um, uh, photonics so at the moment it's with uh, electrons but how we communicate in chips and now making light chips so that will also increase uh, increase the speed uh, and calculation power um, so with all these technologies we absolutely do have the possibility of um, creating this uh, these um, uh, solutions to these challenges um, so it's truly an exponential future that we're looking at um, with all the technologies being on a different part of this curve um, and just to give you another example instead of just computing power is this one is uh, genome sequencing so genome sequencing uh, started back in uh, uh, the first genome was sequenced in about 1999 uh, you see 2.7 billion dollars that was the total cost sequencing one human genome it was the first so everything had to be created to realize that um, the project uh, actually came in within budget they were quite scared in the beginning because the first one percent to sequence the genome the human ma DNA makeup took about seven years and already cost one and a half billion dollars so the project said well you know this is never going to work we don't have uh, another 
uh, times one and a half billion dollars in our uh, project budget. We don't have that amount of time, so we should stop. But luckily, within the group, there were a few, few people that realized, well, actually, sequencing DNA has to do with computer power. So, and that is uh, on the exponential curve. So actually, we've done 1% now, but we'll do 2, and then 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and then we'll be done. And that's indeed what happened. So the budget, uh, the pro project came in on budget, 2.7 billion, uh, and then you just see the astonishing drop in price. So I've actually sequenced my, well, had my DNA sequenced now this year three times. Um, first, of all, I didn't want to do it. I was a bit scared and skeptical about uh, privacy and and the data and stuff like that. Of course, shipping my DNA over to the U.S. Uh, but actually, uh, yeah, I got I got triggered by my curiosity. Curiosity really got me because my mum is adopted, so we never knew who her parents uh, were. Uh, couldn't find out because that was back in the days when that wasn't uh, uh, um, um, yeah noted down very carefully. Um, so I did my test. It was only 70 euros or something like that. Of course, I'm paying with my data, uh, and they're getting. I'm part of a big research uh, group, um, but it's, it's it's growing and growing also exponentially. And how many people are doing this? But within a year, I actually got feedback that I do have family uh, on my mother's side. So I'm not e not not just English. I'm also Welsh, and I met my family uh, this year. So that's what the technology is they're doing now at the moment. Um, so to do a full human genome sequencing still costs 600 euros and companies are now offering it cheaper because it's uh, paying with their data and you're part of uh, uh, a big uh, group. Um, but what does this look like? So again, we have this logarithmic curve going from 1,000 to 10 to 100 to a million. And Moore's law would again be a straight line on this curve. And you can see the price performance just plummeting for the sequencing of a genome. Um, is that just uh, the the yeah the Moore's law? No, it's actually other technology coming and converging. Um, I'll give you an example of what that looks like. This is uh, a lab that sequences uh, human genomes, and you can see it's fully robot uh, robotized. So robots are uh, picking and placing all uh, the samples. Um, and this goes on for 24-7. Uh, also, they're using big data and, uh, and uh, analytics and, um, and AI to sift through all the data and uh, come up with meaningful insights. So here you can see technology really working together with, uh, with the scientists, but therefore also driving down the price. And also, of course, the field, more players in the field, uh, so competing against one another. So that's what you then get is a graph that just plummets down. Um, looking at this graph, I think there's a trend, you could say, getting cheaper and cheaper. I would say that this would then become, perhaps, oh, a reality. This, at the moment, I think is being created, a toilet with a chip in it that would actually analyze my DNA. Every time I flush it at the moment, a bit expensive, $600, or, or I have to get a a subscription to sell my data, but I'm not sure if I would want that at the moment. Um, but what if it's a euro? Or what if it's a euro cent to sequence your DNA? And looking at that graph, that's the way it's going. I think it'll be cheaper in the future to sequence your DNA than to actually the water to flush the toilet. Well, what does that mean for society? Longer life? How, how would that be a longer life? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So indeed, you could connect this toilet to your physician, to the physician at the hospital. It could give me a warning, Michael, we are seeing some changes in your microbiome or your DNA, and we advise you to do more tests. Or if I really go into the future, I could connect it to my printer at home that actually prints out, 3D prints my medicine because that also already exists. There are printers now being developed that can print specifically the medicine 
uh, and the uh, quantities that you need. So it could be a, a great instrument for, uh, for health. But of course, there are also other side uh, issues, as in, again, privacy. So what does privacy mean? Just imagine that we are actually bio tissue shredding machines. Everywhere I go, I'm already leaving traces of my DNA behind my skin cells uh, and yours as well. So it's not just me being disgusted. <laughs> uh, I shred, right? And these days they can take a skin cell and they can transform that into a stem cell. And from that stem cell that they can then create any tissue and organ that they want. So we're coming into this completely different era where we need to really revisit how we look at all these uh, challenges and what privacy is. Um, I want for you to remember this slide, not for the whole of your life, just for a few minutes, but the, you know, the future is already here, it's not evenly distributed. Um, I'll give you another example of, of how technology is advancing in this exponential rate. So, solar cells. They've been around for a long time. In 1977, one kilowatt hour of energy coming from solar cells cost 76 dollars. And then you see 2010, it was 30 cents, okay, not bad, but still too expensive, oil and gas cheaper. And then a breakthrough came. It was in 2018, uh, no, it was before that actually, 2016, the breakthrough came and now in 2018, uh, the price was uh, two and a half dollar cents. So that's actually cheaper than oil and coal. Wow. Okay. But is that in Latvia? No, unfortunately, not yet. It's actually in. Uh, it was in uh, Abu Dhabi or any in the somewhere in the desert where they have a lot of oil. So that's sort of the the weird thing about it. So that they might be the new oil fields, right? Just put it down solar panels. But because of the price drop, there's now a surge, of course, of this technology. So the price point will probably go down. You know, I think energy will be free. Who believes here that energy will be free? Ah, perfect. Not yeah, not in Latvia. <laughs> Oh, oh really? Ah. Oh wow. Hmm. Yeah. So here you see a very good system of of creating uh, innovation or not? Is uh, what do you tax and what do you don't you tax? Um. Yeah. So actually, uh, there are already countries where where it's not even free, but people get paid or organizations have been paid to take the energy because of course. At the moment, we have energy grids that what the energy that is created needs to be uh, used. Otherwise, uh, we get a, an issue with over over current and surges, and that's damaging for the uh, infrastructure. Um, so, actually, in Chile and in uh, Australia, companies have been offered paid to please take our energy because we need to get rid of it. But will that uh, will that stay in that way? I don't know. I think energy will be freely available to certain parts, but uh, that'll be more like a service. So, for instance, if I have an electric car um, and I have a smart grid, a grid that is adaptable and uh, can uh, um, can communicate with my car, um, and I have my agenda set, okay, I need to be somewhere in 10 minutes, my battery is empty. I think I will then be, I will gladly pay to have my car charged there and then on the spot. But on the same way, I can also give my car to the electrical grid and offer that as a sort of a buffering service, as a service uh, to uh, buffer the energy, uh, energy flows. Uh, and then I might get credits for that. So we're going into a whole new uh, era where we are producers and, 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 and users and, um, and energy will be free, but not everywhere at the same time. Um, 
Yeah. And we've spoken now a lot about this exponential graph. You've seen it many times in the, in the screen. Uh, and still, it's not, not easy because, uh, as I mentioned, our brains have not been evolved to think in this exponential way. It's counterintuitive. Um, and to give you an example, uh, here's a graph from uh, the International Energy Agency that made a prediction of how much uh, gigawatts would be uh, created with solar panels in 2030. And so here you see in 2010, they made the prediction, well, it'll be around uh, 20, 27 gigawatts. And then they saw in 2011, a bit more than we had predicted. Let's make a new prediction. And then the year after, whoa, a lot more. Oh, then the prediction will go down. But somehow they were all focused on this spot in 2030. So they didn't really take into account the what they were seeing uh, and make that adjustment. So what actually happened was the black line, exponential. Why? These were experts in energy, oil, coal, linear technology. And PV is of uh, linear, and PV is technology so exponential. Uh, they have now got new graphs, and they have now caught on. But uh, this is just to show you that you know, you're an expert in a certain field. Um, that doesn't mean that you are an expert in what is coming and what is emerging. So it's about really daring to have an open mind, daring to say, I don't know, because what do we know about the future? It's nearly unknowable. Um, and so I want to do sort of a small uh, experiment with you. Um, very easy to judge. Well, pretty easy. 30 linear steps of a meter, of course, is 30 meters. Let me see, have I got a, yeah, hmm. have I got a space that I could use for that? Yeah, I would say 30 meters is uh, twice this room. So uh, this room double is 30 meters. It's not five times this room. Do we agree? Well, who says that it's not as, as five or more? No. Okay, so we can sort of instinctively judge that and, and feel that in. But what if you take 30 exponential steps of a meter? So that means that my first step is one, second step is plus two, and then it's plus four, and I do that 30 times. Yeah, that sound is about right. That, that feels right. It's I've never heard a good uh, uh, answer to this question off the bat. So please feel free. Who says what? Please tell me. Anything. I'll give you a hint. Is it one times around the world? Or two times? One. Who says who says one? Then all the rest says two? So we have someone that is using technology to calculate it. 25, 26. I won't, uh, yeah, perfect. And this is the example, right? So this is counterintuitive, 26 times around the world. That's the difference between linear and exponential. And, and the only way to really grasp that is indeed to do the math, to calculate it. And this is the change that we're seeing in the world. So, again, the linear way of thinking compared to the exponential way of thinking. In the beginning, it goes very, very slowly, right? Uh, and, yeah, I'll give an example in a minute uh, to really get you going. But here you see in the, in the beginning, very disappointing. We experience this, how technology will uh, move forward. But actually, it's hardly doing anything and you know with the iPhone moment Motorola uh, and Ericsson and uh, Nokia 
they were busy giving us what we wanted. And we wanted smaller phones. I can remember my Nokia getting smaller and smaller and smaller, I, n nearly ringing like that. That's what we wanted, that's wha that what we were given. Um, and then came the iPhone. And that revolutionized, of course, how we interacted with our phones. And within just a few years, everybody, a lot of people, had a smartphone. Um, but it wasn't just one technology coming together and creating that iPhone moment. It was uh, the internet, the connectivity had been developed and was at a certain point that it was usable. I can remember a PDA. Can we remember those? A small thing, a stuck sort of a touch screen type of thing and internet connectivity and it worked but it didn't really work and but the technology is actually a lot of that you can you know sort of feel or see back in the iPhone but a really big big thing was of course the touch screen you know that oh that was a magical experience that br brought us even close uh, closer and emotional closer with with the technology right but it was also the app store it was also the battery technology so all these technologies coming together at the right moment in time to create that possibility. And Nokia and Motorola and, and Ericsson didn't see it coming. They were busy with what they were good at. And now hindsight, you say, how could you miss it? Yeah, that's, that's easy. That's 2020 hindsight. But they were not able, because it went so fast, to readjust to the new uh, revolution. Um, but of course, I want to give you uh, some more possibility of a, of a foresight because now looking back there is a pattern and uh, this is Peter Diamandis from uh, uh, the founder of Singularity University um, co-founder and he came up with the six D's of disruption uh, his name is Diamandis so you know it's a good uh, acronym for him mm. and someone that we don't really know but has really shaped our lives is uh, this guy Steve and Steve works for, um, or worked for uh, Kodak. So this is the Kodak example that you may have heard of. Uh, in the mid 70s, he created this digital camera. This is the first digital camera, quite big as you can see, heavy, um, and as a memory storage, it had a cassette tape. Uh, I very often get some younger uh, people that I have to explain what that is and what that did. Actually also invented in, uh, in the Netherlands Eindhoven. I have to say that for the region. Um, but the quality of this was 001 megapixel. Uh, so he came to the board of directors and said, look what I've made, I've created the first digital camera. They said, Steve, yeah, fantastic. What does it do well? Yeah, what's the resolution? 001 megapixel. Okay, uh, we cannot really use that. Uh, we're in high uh, definition film um, uh, business, but go back. Uh, if it's uh, if, if it's better, show us again. A few six months later, I think it was came back and it doubled in performance. Zero zero two megapixel. But yeah, we you know we cannot do anything with that, so it was abandoned. Very logical, you know. Uh, but yeah, we all know now how it's gone because we now know that it's on an exponential curve. So in the beginning, 001, 002, 004, 008, no, that still looks like zero, right? Like it's doing nothing. And then that doubling really comes into life. Um, so, yeah, to give you an example of, uh, of how that works, first a technology gets digitized. So we had the, uh, the analog camera that became digitized, then it's deceptive phase, as just mentioned, looks like it's not going anywhere, and then all of a sudden it is in the disruption phase. Um, in the disruption phase, it goes through that linear uh, line, through what we had expected. So with the camera, that's about two megapixels. When the camera, digital camera came to two megapixels, it became useful. Uh, in the West, uh, people bought a digital camera because they could easily share the, the, the images. And of course, there also, the time was there that we can then send them. Uh, uh, eventually, we could print them out. So other technologies were there to make it, uh, yeah, easy to use and affordable. And Kodak saw that happening. I mean, they saw that. But they said, no, you know, it will always be expensive. 
uh, and we have a lot of developing countries that will still use our films because it's cheaper. But they didn't know back then that technology, once it disrupts, you get a market. You get an uptake. And if you have a big market and uptake, it starts to dematerialize, get smaller, and then it gets cheaper, demonetized. And then eventually it, will it becomes democratized. So at the moment you could say we have about 3 billion photographers and there are a lot more coming because of course we have them on our smartphone. It's not that every person that takes a picture is a photographer but we have other apps for that to make it really look fancy and snazzy. Um, so Kodak, as we know, has gone out of business. 2020 hindsight, very easy. But what now would you think is actually the biggest photo company? Apple, S Samsung, Instagram. Yes, we said that. Yes, Instagram. So that's a startup, or was a startup. You know, 15 people uh, in a in a. I'm romanticizing probably, but in a small room in a loft, created that company, bought out by Google, of course. But that's now the biggest photo company. And if I now ask you, how much does it cost actually to take a photo? Yeah, so this is always a scary part for me, because I get, I was looking at you, and you just went, how much does a picture cost? Uh, uh, nothing. Yeah. 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 It costs something, but it's so neg negligible, and you, you have it within your device, you don't think about it. And if you uh, see how many pictures you can now take, you know, in a burst, you can take more pictures than you can ever before and you used to have to go out you had your your um, uh, camera you had your lenses then you had to have your film of course before you even took a picture you made sure that it was all in focus and it, you know it was a whole ritual to get the, uh, the picture done then of course first of all you went and took your uh, you had your negatives developed so you could then look through your negatives which ones you wanted to have printed so the cost of every click was enormous and now we don't think of it. There's so many pictures that we probably don't even see them all anymore. Um, and that means that actually we are really going to a world of abundance because there are many industries that are following. Um, and just to give you a sort of an insight of abundance, you know, this is North Africa here, yeah, as you can see. If we would put solar panels in this red square, we would have enough energy to supply the whole world. So we don't have scarcity, we have abundance. Every time, every day the sun shines, we get more energy from the sun than we need in a whole year. We just need to somehow... Uh, uh, be able to, to harness it. And the issue, of course, is there are not a lot of people living in that part of the world, so we need to be able to store it and transport it. That's also what is happening at the moment. But we do have an abundance. We just need to utilize it. Um, and, you know, we have an abundance in, 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 uh, in technology. Uh, this really could have been me 20 years ago. Well, uh, maybe 30 years ago. I don't know, 20 years ago. I needed all these devices to be a, a young boy and, uh, you know, be, uh, be in the world. Um, and these days, they're all on your iPhone. They're all apps. We have maybe for a million uh, dollars of apps on our phones, if you compare that to 20 years ago. You know, you could say, and I think this is a lovely saying by Mark, Mark Andreessen, software is eating the world. But if software is eating the world, uh, then I would say AI is eating software at the moment. So we have all our phones with the apps. Um, you know, I think in a few years' time, we won't have those apps on display anymore. You know, as the iPhone revolutionary other interface was, was the touch uh, screen. We're now, of course, going into other 
uh, user interface with voice. Uh, at the moment, Siri might be a bit silly. Uh, it's never really giving you everything you need and want in your personal assistant. But we are training it, right? And that is also on this exponential curve. There's even a technology at the moment that, that uh, senses your vocal cords um, before you speak. Because apparently, if you think something, already your vocal cords are triggered. And they can analyze that. So before that you've thought you thought it, your phone is already giving you the answer you want. Okay. It's out there, not really, really available yet. Um, but then we will just have the AI interface that will look for us online or here or there. And so um, AI is eating software. And of course, we all know how our environment has changed. You know, we do see, uh, I do see a sort of a counter uh, movement that of course we get people that are now enjoying vinyl again. So there is a counter movement on all these things. Um, but you could say, you know, technology is that thing that uh, what was once scarce is made abundant by it. Uh, and just some examples of, uh, of some technology. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a video that you've seen. This is Atlas the robot. Um, billions of dollars were spent to create this robot. And it's an amazing feat of engineering. It's a very difficult to create a bipedal robot for it to be able to balance itself uh, and it can even do that also. But it still looks a bit clumsy, right? It looks like, okay, is this what robots will do? Don't say this to anyone else. It, it looks like me after I've had a, a good night in town. Um, you know, it doesn't look very elegant. It somehow seems to get there. We also see some something new coming. It's already happening, actually. It's uh, it's uh, robots bullying, uh, and um, you know I can already feel sort of ah uh, affection for the robot. Um, so we as people can very easily transmit our emotions and feelings into a robot like this. What they're now studying is can a robot fall in love with us? Um, you know, I think there'll be laws around this, and, and it's already happening with another sort of robot, the autonomous car. Volvo has said, oh, oh, you can feel it, right? And let's see yeah, if the... Yeah, so... Yeah, this sometimes it does this. It's incredible. He actually gets back up. Um, but as I said, it's already happening uh, in Sweden. Uh, there are uh, instances that people stand in front of a Volvo because Volvo said we don't want any people ever uh, killed by a Volvo in 2025. I'm not sure if I get the date right. And therefore, if you stand in front of a Volvo, it won't drive. It's got all these sensors in it. So you can really bully, uh, bully a robot already. So hopefully there will be regulations about that coming. Um, Something that is uh, completely different, but in the same sector, is Baxter. Uh, and this is actually Sawyer, the next level. But this is a robot that is flexible, affordable, and actually works together with humans. That's how it's being created. We know robots uh, of the car industry or the industry being ve very big, very powerful, dangerous behind cages. But now there are new forms of robots that are actually called cobots where they're also very easy to uh, utilize. So even I can program this robot, and you can as well, because you don't need the programming skills anymore. It's actually, you can just take hold of its cuff and make uh, the movement that you want it to make, and that's how it learns. And there was all sorts of sensors to be able to be a bit smart, uh, see and sense you, and therefore also not harm you. And also, it's made in a way so that uh, it's not very strong, so it is exactly tailored to the work that needs to be 
done, and it's affordable. This uh, robot comes in about forty thousand dollars at the moment. So if you imagine that, uh, it's coming into the realm where a company can actually, uh, yeah, use that in in in, uh, in their assembly line, uh, twenty four seven. It comes into maybe uh, the range of the cost of an employee. Some of you have uh, most probably heard of Sophia. So Sophia is um, is an AI, um, an AI that, yeah, still isn't very smart. It might seem that way, uh, but a colleague, a uh, former colleague of mine, actually had an interview with uh, Sophia uh, and had to give in uh, his questions two weeks beforehand so that they could make sure that she would have the right answers. Um, and this is, an, again, another kind of robot, right? This is looking really similar to us. Uh, in Japan, uh, this is a, a movement that is really being developed. Um, but it's kind of freaky at the moment. It's what they call the uncanny valley. It's similar, but we as humans are very much geared towards really uh, uh, noticing people and faces. And it's, it's a bit unnerving maybe for, uh, for me, uh, perhaps for you. But uh, let's see if we can see who's the creator and who's the robot in the video. Different how? Better, faster, smarter. If my mind is different, then am I still Sophia? Or am I Sophia again? Hmm. That's a good question. But you don't have a good answer. So who was the robot? Who was uh, the maker? I can see some um, uh, similarities, right? Um, and, and this also is an example that Sophia was actually given rights, uh, was actually given citizen rights in Saudi Arabia. Um, of course, a PR gimmick, but still for me, it's something uh, that we need to uh, be aware of. Do we want the robots to have uh, the same rights as people? You know, if we're not careful and we don't think of uh, how we uh, give those rights out, uh, we might get uh, an unintended consequence. Um, yeah, so uh, another one that you may have heard of, uh, it's got an interesting part to it, is the chatbot that was created by Google. Who's heard of this one? Quite a few people, great. So what you're going to see is Google's chatbot and a hu uh, real human and okay they probably you know this is a real recording but they probably recorded thousands and this was probably one of the best right but still really listen to what's going on so how's something else for you hi i'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client um i'm looking for something on may 3rd sure give me one second mm -hmm. so that's a robot going mm -hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Wow. Uh, yeah, re revolution. This, you know, it, it, it feels so, so much like a person. That's also what grabbed the attention of a lot of uh, uh, people saying, okay, is this what we want again? Right? This mm -hmm, is innate human behavior that a robot doesn't need, but they put it in to give us that human experience. Again, uh, how will we adapt to this? Uh, will we have legislation that says, okay, you are now uh, in conversation with a bot? Does that need to be said beforehand? I don't know. Uh, we'll see. But what you do also see here is a lot of questions are being raised uh, about the technology gap, right? Uh, people that are able to operate technology and not, and how do we make sure that we have an inclusive society? 
I think in the future also technology will relate to us uh, human beings a lot more or that it will be easier to use. So this interface already makes it, yeah, that we don't notice the technology. I would say good technology is technology that you don't, don't notice. It's in the background. It's doing its job, but it's just naturally interfacing with, with you as a person. Um, so that's a great example of where it's already going to. Um, yeah, now an, an example of uh, another robot, an autonomous, semi-autonomous car. Uh, who's seen this video before? Few people. Great. Uh, listen for a beep. Beep. So uh, also there are no major uh, injuries, some injuries, but no, 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 no deaths. Um, but you could hear the beep quite early before the accident happened. Let's try that again. So see how you can see if you can see the the, the time between the beep and the flash. You know, a lot of time, and uh, so much time that the Tesla could put on its emergency brakes and make sure that they were safe. And this happened through the system of the sensors going underneath and beyond the car and actually interpreting as, as this is going to be a crash. Do we want this? It's a safety option. Wow, fantastic. But it's sort of, you know, it's already going into, into the realm of prediction. Wow. And where does that begin and where does it end but this is a fantastic feature and what is fantastic about of course electric cars or Teslas is that they're less cars than that they of course are uh, t platform technology so all other cars are updated and, and, and are, l are learning this and that's the big difference between an electric car and, uh, and a car at the moment is really uh, you know technology that is surrounding us and is a uh, is, uh, on the streets as, as we speak. And what would that mean if we have autonomous cars in the future? What would that mean for how we design cities? Because at the moment, uh, the city is very much designed around cars and mobility. Uh, that happened uh, uh, around the 30 40 or 40s, 50s, that, that was a big imp impetus. But just imagine a city where you don't see cars parked and what that would do for house prices even. At the moment, house prices in the city, in the center, near all the amenities are quite high. But if you can live in nature with greenery and lovely surroundings, and you can call uh, an autonomous uh, Uber or a taxi, you don't have the issue of uh, being in a traffic jam or having to drive, you can relax in the car, you can do your work, you can do a VR a simulation, you can have a conversation, whatever. So the traveling doesn't cost you anything. So that will also change how we design cities uh, and will probably do something to market prices. Um, let's see. Yes. Um, another form of technology also out of the region. So this is uh, a 3D printer. We know 3D printing has been around for a long time, uh, but this 3D printer is as large as the room. It's a metal 3D printer, and it prints uh, titanium uh, parts uh, and, uh, and other metal parts. At the moment, still quite pricey, uh, in the sense that you would not do uh, uh, full-on uh, fabrication uh, for, for a lot of parts, but for aviation, and for Formula One teams at the moment, a very good model because a completely different way of being able to create uh, material. Instead of taking away material, this of course adds it, and that means that we can create, uh, yeah, a lot cheaper, lighter uh, structures and stronger. Um, and this 3D printing at the moment, if we look at this, uh, this organization, is is fantastic in the sense that. 
Uh, this was created with about 48 people. So it's a big high-tech industrial machine. But it was created by a company that started off with 48 people. Why? Because they designed the machine, they sold the machine, but they did not uh, create the machine. They are the assembly company. So actually they gave all the units out to the ecosystem, to their partner companies that had all the core competencies already, because they were making other machines. And they said, could you make this machine for us? They gave the specs, it was built, and they brought it together. So they don't, they don't do everything themselves. And in that way, they were able to create a very high-tech, uh, complicated machine with only 50 people in their own company. Um, another example of uh, innovation is, uh, is this uh, solar car. So this week, um, the solar challenge has started again in Australia. Um, uh, of course, the challenge to drive as quickly as possible uh, across Australia. There's a lot of sun, a lot of uh, possibility there. Uh, and the Netherlands has done quite well in the past years, uh, winning first place with the University of Delft, because it's a student uh, competition. And uh, the Eindhoven University thought, okay, let's not compete with our own uh, uh, city. Let's do another uh, a race, and that's the people carrier race. So you have the, the one that uh, is about uh, speed, and this one is speed, but also in a family car solution. So four people have to go on the ride. Um, won twice now, uh, but what is really, really exciting is actually that from this student team, now this has been created. So this is the first actual solar car. Um, is mm, if you want, you can order one, a pre-order. They'll be uh, they'll be uh, created in the in the coming years. Um, but with this car, you know, you can nearly drive uh, continuously on just solar panels. So this whole area is all solar panels. And to be able to do that, they completely recreated the car, right? They completely went back to the drawing board and made it as light and strong and light as possible. Com completely different uh, uh, ways of manufacturing than the traditional car industry. You know, if you look at a, a normal electric car, it's maybe 2,000, 2,300 kilos. Whew. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's not going to work if you want to drive on solar power. So this is completely re-engineered in a way that is uh, optimum for uh, light strength and therefore solar power. But it's more than that. Because if it becomes autonomous, which it eventually most probably will, then it's also an energy infrastructure. It's a power plant. It can drive autonomously and give its energy to another region. Uh, maybe you'll get another business model that actually traveling in this as a person doesn't cost any money because it's actually transferring energy. Uh, and if it would have its own blockchain wallet, you know, it could even uh, exchange uh, uh, currency in that way drive itself to the cleaning station, get it cleaned, and uh, pay the bill there. So we get a completely different form of infrastructure that is uh, mobile. Um, so in order to wrap up, um, we have these great big challenges. We have enormous uh, potential. All these technologies that are coming online are on this exponential curve um, that are intertwined and interlinked, so very complex. So I want to invite you to uh, think about um, the minimum principles uh, and give you this insight also of the 12 wolves that changed Yellowstone Park. 12 wolves had what they called a cascading trophic effect, a domino effect, as you will. Uh, they actually changed the way the rivers flowed in the park. Why? because they had an effect on the deer that were there. There was an overpopulation of deer that was eating away all the vegetation, uh, and therefore eroding the land. Uh, and the wolves didn't come in the park and starting hunting them and killing all the deer. No. Because the wolves were there, the deer adopted a different behavior. They felt found shelter. They didn't feel so free to roam and graze everywhere. So that then gave the opportunity for shrubs and new plants to grow and that then created more biodiversity and new animal species came into the 
uh, into the scene. Uh, for instance, the beaver came back, and the beaver then created the dams, which then eventually made the river flow in a different way. So 12 wolves can change how a river flows by using the cascading trophic, the domino effect. Just imagine what you can do once you use your mindset of abundance and these exponential technologies for a better world. And if you're wondering where we are at the moment, I'll just, oh, we are right here at this moment. This is the same robot six months ago, a few years after the first video you saw. It doesn't look so clumsy anymore. I'm thinking, hmm, this is something that I cannot do. Wow. And what is, of course, amazing is that this robot can now do it forever and all the other robots that are coming online can also do it. So if you're wondering where we are at the moment, yes, we are in Latvia, yes, we are in Riga, but we are right here. Thank you very much. So we have finished a bit earlier but that's not the problem because we have some time for the questions right and we have tons of questions here and let's start with the first one yes how do you predict human relationships where are they going mm, ah. so um uh -oh. where so yeah that's so where are human relationships going Mm. Um, well, we see, of course, a younger generation that uh, has more difficulty in relating face-to-face. -face. Uh, studies have uh, come out that, uh, uh, yeah, that's difficult for them to interact in that way. Um, you know, I think I think that that the. Uh the value of human attention and human interaction will actually increase as there's more robot interaction. You know, I think actually there'll be uh, this sort of uh, wish for human messiness. Uh, we will have a lot of processes and a lot of robots that will do things perfectly. But do we as people want everything always the same and perfect or do we like the imperfection also? Uh, more a philosophical question. Uh, does that uh, give you an extra insight? And that's my what I see. Uh, I'm curious to what you see, actually. What do you see? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you're saying, uh, am I scared for uh, robots taking over? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Ab the human touch. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That. That. Uh, that. That. That is and will be. Uh, will be possible. And you're al already seeing it, right? That. Uh, that people are falling, well, it's, it's ever so slight, but people are falling also in love with chatbots or certain robots. It's not widespread, but yeah, uh, that's happening. Uh, that'll probably go on. Um, and I think, you know, 
we will get to a certain point where can we then still really see the difference or experience the difference between what is real and what is not real or what is robot, what is not robot. That's a possibility, absolutely. A lot further down the line. Um, will they take over? I think it's very important. And I think Europe is, 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 is doing very well in that. It's robots and AI is, is looking at ethical AI and how can we to make sure that the AI that we're creating is, is, is in service to, to humanity and that we keep humans in the loop. Um, in contrast to maybe China or or uh, uh, U.S., and I think you know bringing that all back together is is a uh, it's a yeah it's important yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the um, risks. Uh, what other risks do you see uh, together with this exponential gro uh, growth? Because as you were mentioning, uh, there's a lot of opportunities, but there are also there are many uh, consequences we might not know or face or you know predict because as you see there's a house you know uh, in that yeah. uh, future yeah. so what other risks do you see uh, taking into account all of that let's say cool what other risks well i wanted to of course end with being very positive uh, but also about being um, positive and and um how do i say it uh cautiously cautiously optimistic i think that's that's important uh, there are so many risks uh, with what we do, and you know the metaphor uh, I think for this would be, um, I think thousands of years ago, uh, people would have said, "Don't don't play with fire." That is for the gods. Uh, you will burn your fingers, which we did and do still do. Uh, you will burn down a ho house, what has probably happened and is happening all over. Um, so you know we even have the expression, "Don't play with fire," or "He's playing with fire." So it's. And I would make the analogy that that's what we're doing at the moment with, with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but what did we do with fire? Are we masters of fire at the moment? Still not. But, I mean, I we have these big fires that we cannot contain. We cannot, you know, the, the bushfires. But we have created systems to be able to react and respond quickly. And we have learned uh, how to build out and construct our cities and houses to uh, uh, diminish the risk. And uh, everybody quite literate in dealing with fire. Um, but still, we are not masters of fire. But we've created systems in order to uh, yeah, you know, play make the risk lower. And so I think that's what we need also for AI, but actually for everything. But it needs to be in a quicker feedback loop, right? Uh, we need to be able to adjust more, more quickly in a PCBA cycle fashion. Uh, and if we don't do that, well, which risks are there? Uh, yeah, I think I think the the biggest risk at the moment is actually our our economic system. Uh, our economic system is not geared for a world of abundance. Um, so how how do we adapt our current model to a more future-proof model in the in the same way or in the same time that we also make sure that everybody is included? And in, in that transition, I think that's maybe the biggest risk we have in the, the Western world is is not so much being able to think of uh, a positive, bright future and, and, and tackling the uh, challenges and using the technology, but is how do we get there? Uh, because we have great infrastructures. We don't have uh, crises at the moment, not really. But will we wait until we truly, truly, truly have crises, or will we be wise enough to uh, make sure that we do it beforehand so there's less uh, uh, hurt and pain in the, in the meantime, less, less suffering. So that would be, for me, the biggest uh, yeah, challenge, crisis. Yeah. One more question. How have you implemented uh, this exponential thinking in uh, your own business, practically? Mm. Great. Yeah. So, at the moment, my uh, my 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 vision. Uh, I really want to bring coaching into the world. I feel that coaching is a great instrument uh, to uh, create a sort of awareness and, and consciousness. For me, uh, consciousness is what we need in order to create uh, solutions to the problems we have at the moment. 
Um, but it's quite difficult and costly. So I'm now starting at the beginning. So how can I democratize coaching for millions of people around the world? Um, and so now developing first step an app. From the app, want to create multiple coaches that come together, coach people, uh, more of an Uber type of uh, situation. But then also training an algorithm uh, that eventually my point will be an AI coach um, that can coach you or you on your specific individual needs in a way that is meaningful for you. Uh, that's my faraway future. Uh, and my MTP is to create a world where we have a higher state of consciousness, where we act in another way and create systems that are good for humans, good for the planet and for each other. Um, might sound crazy, but that's just what I like. Yeah. Okay. I assume that there are no more questions at the moment, maybe later on, but uh, yeah, one more. Yep. Oh, no, so yes, so no, it, it can also drive in the nighttime because it does have a, a battery. So it's, uh, it's charging itself uh, with the solar panels and it's got a battery so it can travel at night. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, so in the Netherlands, uh, I think it can 600 to 800 kilometers. It can drive on a single, uh, yeah. So it's not, not yet a perpetual mobile, but it's perhaps coming. But just imagine if you're an adventurous outdoor person, you can now travel everywhere where there aren't any gas stations anymore. You can just keep on driving, right? So uh, for the advent adventurous type as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's give My a pleasure. huge round of applause for Michael today. Thank you.